Please turn. To all of you for your cards and your prayers. But some of the advice that you've given to me, I take with a grain of salt. <laughs> no, I am not going to buy an elevator for my stairs. No, I am not going to find a one-story house. And my answer is this. Some of you people have gone to other countries to hike high mountains. Some of you hike high mountains in Arizona and Colorado, even the white tanks. And you do it fearlessly. And you do it intrepidly. I have a flight of stairs that I can do the same thing. It doesn't cost me thousands of dollars. Whatever damage is inflicted, the insurance picks up. And I also ascend those steps fearlessly and without trepidation. So I thank you for your advice, but I have my own hiking project and I have a sense of exhilaration each time I get to the top of the steps and I don't have broken toes. So see there. Well, thank you for your prayers and your support and also for your tongue-in-cheek uh, <clears throat> advice as well. Turn with me, if you will, please, to Isaiah chapter 6 as we open our series in this Advent season. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth, and with it said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. And then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. And then came the command, Go, go tell the people. I should think that just about this time we all start putting things in gear. Thinking about putting up the tree, thinking about who gets what gifts, uh, what's going to be on the menu and all of those things and there's a lot of memories that come up as well. And we are in times when we find that some people get terribly sensitive. You don't dare say Merry Christmas because you've committed the unpardonable sin by secular standards. And I was looking back on the internet for years ago. My granddad was in charge of maintaining the Christmas decorations at City Hall in Denver. And it was really quite an elaborate thing, at least it was for a little boy. And that was his papo doing it. So I got online, and sure enough, they're still doing the Christmas lights. And I thought, I wonder if they do a nativity scene. As I clicked on a picture, I thought, well, look, there's a nativity scene. Sure enough, there was a nativity scene, and inside it there was Santa Claus and all of his helpers. And I guess Jesus got bumped because he couldn't pay the rent. Things have changed, but that shouldn't make one bit of difference to you and me. Because the birth of Jesus Christ is a family thing. It was a family thing when the nation seemed to put more of an emphasis on it. And even if the nation goes entirely indifferent, the people of God are not because this, this is our birthday party for our king. And that never changes. And if I want to say Merry Christmas, 
based on the freedom of speech, I'm going to do it. And if someone wants to say happy holiday, I'll say thank you. But this is our birthday party. This is when we celebrate the gift of God's love. But there's one thing that comes to mind. And that is that we place the emphasis upon the birth. And so we should. Because without the birth, we couldn't have the ministry. Without the ministry, we wouldn't have the crucifixion. Without the crucifixion, we wouldn't have the resurrection. Without the resurrection, we wouldn't have the ascension. Without the ascension, we would not have him who seated at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for us. And there would be no reason for him to return. So this we need. And this we have. And for this we give thanks. But I want to, this Sunday and next, in the morning, as briefly as we can, to emphasize the source. We emphasize the arrival. It's the advent. It's the first coming of the Lord. It's the birth of Jesus. And all of these things are correct. And it's the arrival of the great king. But sometimes we need to emphasize the point of departure. Because in my judgment, the point of departure even adds a greater understanding of the infinite value of that great gift that has been given to us. And Isaiah provides that for me. It gives us the opportunity to see the starting point. And at least the starting point in part. And so I want us as quickly as we can to look at Isaiah's vision and to notice the transformation that took place at the conclusion of that vision and then to note the relevance for you and for me. I was reading an article that basically said people don't like to read the Bible anymore the way they used to because they say, what does an old book have anything to do with me in the 20th and 21st century? And we, of course, say it has everything to do with us in any century. And so we want to look at the vision of Isaiah. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, and the train of his robe filling the temple. Without PowerPoint, without television, without movies, can we construct this scene in our minds? Here is this magnificent throne room. And here is a throne that is built up so that everybody who walks in needs to look up to see the one who is seated on the throne. And notice it's called a temple. It is the dwelling place of the sovereign God. And the throne itself, the concept of complete and absolute authority, the picture is one of majesty. It is one of sovereignty. And notice the robe. It fills the entire space. This is typical oriental attire for kings and for great kings. They would wear these robes with a long train. But notice here is one that fills the entire room. And with the length of the train, the greater the sense of authority and sovereignty possessed by the one wearing the robe. The garment speaks of the grandeur and the majesty of the great king. And the person with sovereign authority, notice who he is. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Notice that in the verse before, in verse chapter, chapter 6, verse 1, there was the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, Adonai, the one with sovereign power and the prerogative to use it, consistent with his person and his principles. And here in verse 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is Jehovah, the personal name, the name used to be identified with his people. And as he identifies with his people, notice he is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord over the armies who will protect his people. Adonai, the sovereign. Jehovah, 
the one who cares for and protects his people. And notice above all else, he is the king of all. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Here he is, the king, and he is my God, and he is the Lord of hosts. And I have just walked into the presence of absolute holiness. It's as though you've, invited to, you've been invited to this great gathering, a black tie event. And you come straight in, straight in from doing farm work. In terms of attire, you're out of place. I forget where it was that I was going, but I remember it was a rainstorm and I was in a suit. And I didn't have a raincoat. I stepped out of the car into the puddle. By the time I ran to the building, my hair was going every which direction. My suit was wet. I really wanted to be home at that moment because my attire was no longer suitable and I was embarrassed. What is it going to be like to stand in the presence of absolute perfection? This is the picture being portrayed and he is the king of all. And let's look at that a little more closely as we see the seraph's song. And the seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Here are his servants, his celestial servants who do not have to wrestle with the temptations and the trials that we do. And there we see them standing before him in total awe, adoration, and worship. And we see them with this great sense of humility as they covered themselves in humility. And yet they will fly to do the Lord's will. And we notice their doxology, their song of praise. They sing of the holiness of God. And they sing of the glory of God and they sing to his glory. And you and I as worshipers should never lose sight of this as a pattern of worship, not just when we get together as a congregation, but as born again believers Every day and every moment of our life is a worship service. Whatever we do, in word or in deed, we do heartily as unto the Lord, whether we're out shopping, whether we're in the kitchen, whether we're at church. Zechariah reminds us, and that reminds me, Bill, thanks for filling in so quickly when you got the call at 6 in the morning. Zechariah reminds us that the time is coming and you and I already live out that future when there is no such thing as sacred or secular. Everything is holiness to the Lord and that's how you and I are to live our lives right now and as we do, we can become prophets of the future for the day is coming when everything will be holiness to the Lord. Even the pots and pans of the kitchen, Zechariah tells us. For me, that's pretty close now this time of the year. And let's be sure that as we gather together that we are not singing because we like this tune or that tune or the other tune or we like how jumpy this is, that is, there. that is a secondary matter at best. What is uppermost and what is foremost is that we are singing to the glory of God and we are singing about His glory. And this is what the life of faith is about. And we notice the sovereign's response as well. And the foundation of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. 
Notice when he spoke the words, whatever they were, they were words filled with power and everything trembled. And the smoke of his presence that filled the room speaks of his pleasure in hearing those words of praise. And just as the whole temple is filled with the glory of the Lord, notice that the angelic host also says that the earth is too. That's the vision. And it's a very moving one in my view. But let's look at Isaiah's transformation. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah sees himself in the presence of a holy God. And consequently, he is struck with grief because he knows that he has been created in the image of God. And he knows that as the image of God, he is to reflect perfectly the one for whom he was created to be such a reflection. And when he sees the antitype, and he sees himself as the type, he says, what a discrepancy. My very calling is to live my life in a manner that absolutely reflects the greatness of my creator, my redeemer, and my king. And he says, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. What I speak represents what's in my heart. And the people whom I represent we're just exactly alike. We are the two leaves on the same branch. And he recognizes that the people are in the same condition. But we thank God that this is a confession that leads to something good. And we see the cleansing. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it. And he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Two things. Cause and effect. The cause of his grief has been handled. The effect of his grief has been handled. Grieve no more. For that which calls you to an understanding of being unclean, that is all gone. You are clean. And the thing that made you unclean, the sin, you are forgiven. And let us be sure that when we know that we stand forgiven, we no longer indict, accuse, or penalize ourselves for something that the great judge himself has said, it is no more. One of the consistent things that I have found in my life as a pastor are people who continue to condemn themselves when God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has quit doing it years ago. And that is one of the greatest aspects of this Christmas gift. Isaiah sees himself in the presence of the Holy God. He's filled with grief, but he is not only cleansed, but he is forgiven. And with that forgiveness comes a new sense of living. There is a renewed commitment. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. I enjoy my new state. I enjoy my relationship with you. And I want my people to know this same joy. I have an opportunity to represent the Almighty, Holy God, the Lord of redemption and life. This is the greatest opportunity that could ever be handed to me. Here I am. Send me. And that's Isaiah's transformation. But what relevance has this to you and to me? I hope that most of us, if not all, already see the relevance for we are seeing the gospel being played out in a very private theater, but nonetheless real. 
And let us look at it then. For notice what John said, and if you do not remember any other verse that I have shared this day, score this one. This is the linchpin. This is what gives to us the relevance. It may be long ago, around 740 B.C., that Isaiah had this vision. But what he saw pertains to us this day. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Go home and read this passage and notice that that his glory. John says, these things Isaiah said because he saw the glory of the pre-incarnate Christ. Who was sitting on that throne? It was none other than the one who would enter Bethlehem's place. We are looking at the pre-incarnate Christ. We are seeing who Jesus is before he took on the mantle of humanity. And I hope this. Over the years I've read where people say, oh, I can hardly wait to see Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee in his sandals and in his robe and all that. I'm telling you, that day is gone. That's never happening again. The next time we see Jesus Christ, we see him in his glory, his majesty, and his splendor. And that's what we are being prepared for by Christmas. And Isaiah saw the glory of the one whom we call Jesus. And that one seated on the throne is our Lord and our Savior. And notice that he has come to make us acceptable. Acceptable to the Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Paul said it clearly, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Just as Isaiah stood there and looked at the greatness and the purity of God and looked at himself and said, woe is me, I'm ruined. Paul says in so many words, Isaiah was speaking on behalf of every human being. It's the glory. It's the glory that's absent. And it's the glory that needs to be placed again in our lives. And it is simple as this. The term confess means to say it as it is. Don't say yes, but. Just say yes, that's it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice those two words, forgiveness and cleansing. Just what Isaiah found at the foot of the throne. Jesus has come to effect our forgiveness and to effect our cleansing. And he has come as well to ask the question, who will go for us? And we should respond. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has, does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him. And we will see him just as he is. I don't have to worry about standing in the presence of Jesus Christ in all of his glory and say, woe is me, I am undone. I do not have to worry about saying, I am a ruined man. Because Jesus Christ has come. He has come to prepare me and all others who will profess him as Lord and Savior, not to be ashamed at his coming. Even now we are the children of God. And it has not yet appeared what we will be. But this we know. That when he appears we will be like him. For it's that basis alone. That allows us to see him. As the glorious holy redeemer of our lives. And he has come to prepare us to stand in that great temple. And as 
we see from Revelation, all of the sentient creatures, all of the thinking beings gather around the throne and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and to all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne, even to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. We all get to sing the hallelujah chorus. I can't hit all those high notes, but I love listening to it. And I love this promise that the day is coming when I can sing hallelujah. Praise be to Jehovah. And all of creation gathers around And they say to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. The sum of the matter seems to be this. The call to trust in the Lord is now. But as many as received him, to them he gave the authority, the right to become children of God even to those who believe on his name, who were born again, as it were, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I have a life that has been given to me by God. And to those who trust in him have the right to enter into the family, and a right that can never be abrogated nor negated. And one thing is clear. And it's quite clear that everyone one day will recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Some will bow to their Lord and to their Savior. Others will bow as vanquished opponents. But the one thing humanity has in common Every knee will bow. Some joyfully will confess Jesus is Lord. And others will ruefully confess the same. As many as received him. For this reason also God has highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The source, the source was seated at the throne. Everything that took place in Bethlehem, everything that has taken place because of Bethlehem, looks back to the throne, looks back to the one whom we know to be Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ. And when we speak of source, we speak of cause. And this we never forget. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I trust that you can say, Pastor, I have embraced the one who sat on the throne, who divested himself of majesty to become a servant that I might be a loyal subject to him who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if you can't say that, then let's talk because it is a simple remedy. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for all of the splendor that he has because he is the word who in the beginning was with you and was a part of that equality. And we thank you that he divested himself of the majesty that we might enjoy being a part of the eternal family.